well in the last class we were talking about the crystal directions and planes and what we named them as Miller indices of directions and Miller indices of planes. Well, just to say what we talked about, we said the unknown Miller indices are used for directions as HKL and for planes we can write HKL and I told you that we do not use XYZ. Any of the indices which consist of more than one digit we need to have a separator otherwise we do not use separator this is very important. So, for example, direction 1 bar 1 1 I do not have to use a separator, but if it is a direction 1 12 0 I need to put a separator right. Then if the indices happen to be negative the bar is placed on top of the index like here and is read as bar 1. Members of a family of a directions as I told you they are need not be parallel like I in a cube I showed an example of edge of a cube which is parallel to the A axis is 1 0 0, parallel to the B axis is 0 1 0. They look alike physically, but they are perpendicular to each other in a cube. Okay. Similarly, members of a family of plane that is those planes physically look identical like the front face and the back face in a cube, the top face and the bottom face right hand side face and the left hand side face they look alike they form a family these planes again belong to the family 100 zero zero, right they are not parallel because we said that all parallel equidistant planes are given one index they are called the same thing because they will be looking alike absolutely and their location in space is also parallel in the same way in the crystal. By changing the sign of indices it is possible in case of directions to reverse the direction. Say for example, we talked about this direction for that let us name these axis A, B and C this direction is 0, 0, 1. But if I put this direction here you can name it the way I told yesterday it will be 0, 0 bar 1. They are parallel but the sense is opposite right that is how by changing the sign 0 if I change the sign there is no need we do not change the sign for 0 and 1 the sign is changed becomes bar 1 the direction is reversed you can try for any other direction for that matter. Similarly in case of planes I told you that the by changing the sign of indices I go to a plane opposite side of the origin okay. Say for example, in this case let me take a plane and name my axis as A, B and C you will name this plane as 1 0 0 and I have taken my origin there. If I take my origin here and try to find the name of the plane which is here, the back you would name this as bar 1 0 0. 
I change the sign and one is the back of the means this origin is here plane is at the back origin is here the plane is in front it is 100 zero zero. this is the same set of planes actually and the in distance between them is here that is what we shall see next All right. Next, we talked about uh, as I said, the set of parallel equidistant planes are given one name. Okay. That's what I want to show you here. What happens when the distance between the planes changes? They are still parallel. Let's talk about the bottom face and the top face. of this unit cell let me name this as a b and c the top face if i name you will find out becomes 0 1 and the bottom face when i work out by taking the origin here you know that it is 0 bar 1 0 so the set is this top plane here and this bottom plane there and the distance between them is given by this let's call that d010 right now let's locate in a unit cell same unit cell maybe let's name this as c here a here and b there this plane in the middle if i start with this origin it is parallel to a parallel to c and makes an intercept of half on b so intercepts are infinity half and infinity <laughs> the reciprocals of these intercepts would become 0 2 so this pink plane here is 0 2 if i take the origin on this 0 2 let me find out what is the top plane that will also be 0 2 in the word now the set of 0 2 0 planes is one the top here is pink and the one in the bottom here this constitute the set of 0 to 0 while the set of 0 1 0 is the bottom and the top can you see the difference here i have an interleaving plane between the two 0 1 0 planes the spacing between them what i call d 0 2 0 is half of what is d 0 1 0 in the words you can also say that A zero one zero set of planes is a subset of zero two zero, but only thing is that sometimes zero two zero plane may not exist in a crystal. Means there are no physically no atoms are lying on that. So, for example, simple cubic crystal, simple cubic crystal, the atoms are only at the eight corners of the lattice point, or I means the unit cell. Lattice points are only at the corners there is no atom going to be there in the middle physically that is not a plane right that's the only thing we are it is possible but this 0 to 0 set is going to be top plane the bottom plane and an interleaving middle plane in them there and 0 1 0 is the bottom and the top is this clear that's what we started with that equidistant parallel planes given one name this set of three planes here will be called 0 to 0 this will be called 0 1 0 and i said if they are parallel only distance is different they are related the relationship you can see that 0 2 0 0 1 0 1, 1 and 2 1 has become 2 there right we shall also see further now this relationship in terms of numbers and expression 
well this is a problem I shall leave out uh, for you to work it's very simple to do that only it is true in a cubic crystal that a direction HKL is perpendicular to the plane HKL in other words you would notice that a 0 1 0 direction is perpendicular to 0 1 0 plane but it is true in a cube only you may not find this to be true in any other crystal system and secondly when you are doing that you will also be able to show this that in crystal systems where the three axes A, B and C are orthogonal to each other what are such crystal systems cubic, tetragonal and orthorhombic all right. So, there the distance between an HKL plane D is related to the indices of the plane HKL and the lattice parameters A, B, C like this. Well, in orthogonal system you can use the uh, to solve these problems you can use the Cartesian set of axes because they are orthogonal to each other and distance A, B, C unit distance you can convert into angstroms knowing the val value of uh, A length, B length, C length convert them into angstroms <coughs> and use the knowledge that sum of the squares of the direction cosines is 1. Okay. If you use that you will be able to get first and the second both these solutions. Now we shall use this formula for cubic system. In a cubic system notice that A becomes equal to B becomes equal to C. On the right hand side I have a com common denominator and therefore 1 upon D square becomes equal to H square plus K square plus L square divided by A square which I make reciprocal I can write it like this I can write like this d square is equal to a square divided by h square plus k square plus l square now you can see I just showed you what about 0 1 0 and 0 2 0. Let us see for 0 1 0 the d would be a square divided by 0 plus 1 square is 1 plus 0 that becomes a square or in the words d is equal to a. Let us do the same thing for 0 to 0 which I showed you is an interleaving plane between 2 0 1 0. Let us see what does do we get for d. d square is equal to a square divided by 0 plus 4 plus 0 <coughs> becomes a square by 4 and d becomes a by 2. This is half the distance between the planes that is why 0 to 0 is an interleaving plane between 0 1 0 planes right. All right now with this we move on to do the determination of a crystal structure and we shall be showing you something for very simple structures complex structures a little involved however it is possible and we have been able to identify and list these are available in the literature thousands of crystals are already known and they are very complex some of them are very very complex structures but in this course the first course we shall look at very simple structures like let us say space lattice is body centered cubic and motif or the basis was only one atom of iron sitting on the BCC it is a BCC iron crystal. How do we determine the crystal structure of such a crystal or FCC space lattice 
one copper atom sitting on it or one nickel atom sitting on each lattice point becomes either FCC copper crystal or it becomes FCC nickel crystal. How do we identify these crystal structures? How do we determine this? For this we use X-ray diffraction or electron diffraction or neutron diffraction. Procedure used is basically diffraction. Whether I use X-rays, electromagnetic radiations or I use high energy particles like electron or high energy neutrons which can also behave like waves you know. So, we shall study the X-ray diffraction uh, using the X-rays. We shall look at the di diffraction. The X-rays we use are characteristic radiations of certain metals. This is when an electron from the K shell is knocked off by some high energy electron, the metal target is made a, a cathode and electrons from the inode at high velocity come and impinge on the metal target, they knock off some electrons from the let us say K shell. Electron from the L shell will try to drop into the K shell and lose its energy. That radiation is what is called is being called the X rays, the crystal, uh, characteristic radiation, and it gives a maximum intensity is produced for this K alpha radiation. They are the different metal targets, and here are their wavelengths. You see these wavelengths, all these wavelengths are in the range of 1 to 2 angstrom. This is the range in which atomic diameters exist <coughs> and in other words the wavelength which we are using to study the windows in the crystal, windows will be of the size of the atomic diameters, spaces between the uh, atoms you know. So, the diffraction occurs like in the slit experiments you have done in school. Like the diffraction is also done by these three dimensional crystals which have three dimensional windows or you can call them three dimensional slits. And therefore, the radiation used is of the same order of magnitude in wavelength as the spacing between them right. Now, what happens actually when these X rays are impinged on the crystal for which you are trying to determine the crystal structure, there are electrons orbiting around nuclei of of each uh, nuclei of every atom, they are just orbiting around. When this X rays fall on them, they start additionally oscillating with the same frequency as the frequency of the X rays. As a result, these electrons in turn start radiating X rays because they are oscillating, all oscillators are going to radiate. But in most directions, these radiations come out in the incoherent fashion. What is the meaning of the incoherent fashion? The let us say one oscillator gives out in this direction radiation <coughs> like this. there is another one which gives out radiation like this. There is a third one it gives out like this, so on so forth. Well, if you now keep adding more and more waves coming from there are going to be electrons in the range of transfer 24, 26 and they are all radiating and they are radiating in different directions with different uh, phase. So, they at any point you want to see the net intensity is 0. 
net amplitude the positive amplitude negative amplitude the net intensity net amplitude is zero these are the incoherent radiations which occur in most of the directions but there are very few directions in which they meet in a coherent fashion that is they are all in phase 1 second one third one so what is going to happen at any point the amplitude would be three times it will be increasing so net amplitude would be very high and we will be able to see the intensities coming out in that direction. There are very few uh, directions, we are those directions that is what we shall see the next. <coughs> Here I show you a picture where I have three planes taken in a crystal, these are the atoms placed on these planes and this is the incident ray of x-rays, <coughs> coming from that direction that is the wave front, it is coming and we will consider one ray, this is one incident ray in the beam, this is the second incident ray, one falls onto this plane and makes this angle theta, what I call the incident angle. This is different from what you have defined incident angle in reflection, okay. This is the angle made not with the normal to the plane, but the angle made with the plane, right. And this is the incident ray that is the transmitted ray. Most of the x-rays what we impinge onto the crystal from which we are trying to understand the crystal structure, they just get transmitted most of it. A fraction of the intensity is the one which gets diffracted and that diffraction let us say it is taking place in this direction and this one from here is diffracted in that direction that is called the <coughs> I will be able to observe these provided they are in phase here, that is what I talked about the coherent. If one is coming out coherently with the other, I will be able to observe this, otherwise I shall not be able to observe this. Now in the Bragg law, we consider this process as what we have considered in school in reflection in a similar fashion that is this angle of incident is theta, here the angle of diffraction is also theta, okay. This diffracted ray is going there. Now if they are in starting from here, the wave front goes here and it is in phase, the distance travelled by the wave front here and the distance travelled by the wave front here, if either they should be same, if they are not same, the difference between them should be integral multiple of the wavelength then only they will be in phase. If the difference between them is one wavelength, they will again be in phase. If the difference between them is two wavelength, they will be in phase. But the difference between them is a fraction of a wavelength, they will not be in phase. It will be like what I showed you in incoherent fashion. They will be meeting in the incoherent fashion and that is what is happening in most of the directions. This is the direction in which they are meeting coherently. Let us see what is the path difference between them. You can drop a perpendicular from here onto this second ray here, right. And similarly, I can draw a perpendicular from there. So, what happens is this path travelled here, this path travelled here is the same, and similarly, this path from the source up to this point and path from the source up to here is the same. 
so path difference is q p plus p r if i say d is the distance of separation between two consecutive planes in the crystal let us say this plane is h k l then d i am talking about is d h k l this is the d so it is possible for me to find out the distance q p this angle is theta this angle is also theta and therefore q p is equal to d sin theta similarly this angle is also theta so then p r is also equal to d sin theta and the total difference in the path is q p plus p r is equal to d sin theta plus d sin theta is 2 d sin theta. So, if these two rays have to be in same phase or it have to be coherent the path difference q p plus p r must be 2 d sin theta is this clear and if these are uh, means 2 d sin theta must be integral wavelength right that is if they are in cohort if they are coherent I did not make a complete statement the if these two rays are coherent they are in same phase this path difference must be equal to integral number of wavelengths then they are in phase and this gives me the Bragg's law. this gives me the Bragg law which I have written here that n lambda is equal to 2 d sin theta. In this there are number of parameters in this expression n is one parameter it is an integer lambda is the wavelength which radiation I am using that is the value of lambda d is the spacing between the consecutive planes and there could be more than one sets of planes in a crystal like 100, 110, 111, 200, 210 and so on so forth there could be variety of these d spacings then theta values at which this direct will be diffracting will be different. So, there are so many parameters let us try to fix some of them and see what we can get out of it first of all we concentrate on the n what we call the order of diffraction n we refer to as the order of diffraction now to understand this order of diffraction which is an integer and the path difference between the diffracted rays which are coming from two consecutive planes differ by that you know that their path they have traveled by that much distance. No? So, we shall have already we have already seen that a plane h k l like 0 1 0 I showed you is parallel to 0 2 0 and 0 2 0 plane is interleaving 0 2 0 as a matter of fact is a subset of 0 1 0. Similarly, I say 2 0 0 is parallel to 1 0 0. that I can say about any plane n h n k n l where n is then a constant integer is parallel to any plane h k l. In other words if h is 1 k is 2 l is 1 it is I can say 1 2 1 plane is parallel to 2 4 2 plane right. Similarly, it is parallel to 3 6 3 plane right that is the meaning of it. Also from the formula of d which I write again for you d is equal to in a cube a divided by under root h square plus k square plus l square 
I can also say that D100 is equal to twice D200 which I can generalize D for HKL is equal to n times D of NH NK NL can get it from here n square h square plus n square k square plus n square l square uh, from the under root you can always take out n. So, d of h k l will be n times the d of n h n k n l. If we know these relationship what we have done let us see what happens is to this Bragg's law. Now let me consider to look at the Bragg law the second order diffraction that means n is equal to 2 because n I said the order of diffraction. In other words the path difference between the two consecutive diffracted rays from the two consecutive planes is two wavelengths ok. Second order diffraction from 1 0 means two consecutive 1 0 0 planes at a Bragg angle is theta at which it is happening second order means n is equal to 2. Now incident x rays make the same angle theta with 2 0 0 as they make with 1 0 0. Why it is so? They are parallel that is what I have just shown. Therefore, let us rewrite the Bragg's law which is second order from 1 0 0. 2 lambda this is second order 2 d 1 0 0 sin theta it is satisfied. If I simplify this 2 cancels with 2 it becomes lambda is equal to d 1 0 0 sin theta d 1 0 0 I have already seen is equal to 2 d 2 0 0. So, if I rewrite this it becomes lambda is equal to 2 d 2 0 0 sin theta. Now, let us compare this with the Bragg law and lambda is equal to 2 d sin theta. If I compare it, it is a first order diffraction n equal to 1 from a 2 0 0 plane and it is coming in the same direction. In the words, if I am observing a second order diffraction from a set of 1 0 0 planes that is also the ray or the beam coming first order from 2 0 0. What part of the intensity is the first order from 2 0 0? What part of the intensity is second order from 1 0 0? It is not possible for me to distinguish. They are superimposed. So, we consider that order of diffraction is 1 unity n is taken to be 1 and therefore, the Bragg law can be rewritten by taking n equal to 1 lambda is equal to 2 d sin theta out of the parameters n lambda d and theta I have fixed up 1 n equal to 1 and lambda is equal to 2 d sin theta. Then how do I resolve what I am getting is a second order from 1 0 0 or first order from 2 0 0. I just showed you in a simple cubic crystal there is no 2 0 0 plane and if I observe a 2 0 0 diffraction from such a crystal I would know that it is merely a second order from 1 0 0 because physically 2 0 0 is not a plane. But if it is a body centered cube 2 0 0 is a physical plane there is a body center atom sitting there and therefore, it could be first order from 2 0 0, it could be second order from 1 0 0. So, that means we have to understand right. That will be a tacit understanding once I take n to be unity or the order of diffraction to be unity in the Bragg law and modify the Bragg law to read lambda is equal to 2 d sin theta right. Well, generally uh, powder method is used and it is very simple to work with. In here we fix the value of lambda that is we use monochromatic radiation 
characteristic radiation k alpha which we referred to in the beginning of the class and then theta it becomes variable because I am using powder. Powder means millions of crystallites each powder particle is a crystal by itself a crystal has been ground to a powder and it is a very small part powder particle and each one is a crystallite when in an ensemble of this powder when it is kept in a cavity or in a tube or some place these powder particles will be all randomly oriented in space that means each crystal is randomly oriented in space it amounts to saying that crystal has been rotated about all possible axes in all possible orientations once I have millions of such particles that is one advantage which we get using the powder method that theta is becomes all possible combinations all variables uh, theta is a variable and this is what it amounts to it amounts to rotating a crystal about all possible axes in space. The powder particle or powder specimens which are used can be used either in a camera, camera is a device shader camera the geometry of which we shall discuss. In here the specimen is in the form of a tube. This plastic tube which is non crystalline is mounted over a wire of metal and in this tube we can seal these ends with the help of a material like quick fix and tube is filled with the powder particles and then on top you can again seal it with the quick fix. Quick fix non crystalline, plastic tube here is non crystalline, they will not give rise to diffraction and the metal wire of course for rigidity we are using that, it can give rise to diffraction but it is not allowed to come in the beam of x-rays, right. That kind of a specimen is put in the middle of a or in the center of a camera which is a cylinder basically, right. I will show you the geometry of the cylinder from one side there is a hole made and a collimator is placed x-rays come like this incident x-rays of the specimen and they get transmitted like this and the affected rays go in different directions ok. So that is the a powder specimen used or if you are in a great hurry you can use the glass fiber on the glass fiber you can put some quick fix or glue and roll it in the powder so that again you get a cylindrical specimen of the powder which can be kept again in the middle of the uh, camera and x-rays come from one side get transmitted out and diffraction is up. On the cylinder we are putting the film all around the cylinder, the cylinder is like that because this is in the middle of the camera. So cylinder is like that and around this we put an x-ray film on which this the affected rays are observed or can be developed the film can be developed we see that right or else we use a diffractometer. Again there is a powder specimen this powder specimen is kept in a rectangular cavity made in a a metal plate in this cavity you fill the powder and then on top just simply spray some teflon or any other plastic which will keep it together not let it fall at the same time will not give rise to any diffraction right 
Now let us look at the geometry of this diffraction. Geometry of the diffraction in the case of a camera here is my specimen this is the incident ray that is the transmitted ray and that is the diffracted ray. Between the diffracted ray and the transmitted ray the angle is always 2 theta that you see from the geometry of the Bragg law which I made and the specimen here the particular plane which is diffracting let us say is placed like this. So, this angle is theta that angle is also theta, but this angle becomes 2 theta and this crystal or this set of planes in another crystal rotated in this fashion give rise to diffraction in this direction and when this rotation is taking place like this the diffracted ray is really rotating about the incident ray and that forms a cone. This cone is intersecting the film here and there like that different set of crystallographic planes will give rise to another cone may be let us say the cone is somewhere here the next cone that gets recorded into the film here. So, if the film which has a hole here and a hole here so that x rays can go through it is looked at film would look narrow rectangular strip like this with a hole here and a hole there around the holes I have intersection of these cones this will go out and so on <coughs> so forth and maybe there is some more not paired there. Now only thing is from this I should find out what is that diffraction angle for this what is the diffraction angle for this what is the diffraction angle for the other one so on so forth. This is what we have to find out if we can find out this theta we can relate this theta from the formula we have seen the lambda is equal to d sin theta and d is equal to a upon under root h square plus k square plus l square we can try to see how is this theta related to h k l. While we are doing this let us go back to the geometry of the camera. So, this angle is 2 theta and also this angle is 2 theta the cone is intersecting at 2 places making 2 arcs with the uh, film. So, I can relate this if I know the radius of the camera to be r then this spacing between them here to here let us say is s then I can say that 4 theta is equal to s divided by r that is the definition of the angle and this angle is 2 theta plus 2 theta is 4 theta. So, for different pairs of arcs I have different value of theta and that can be measured so, theta can be taken as s upon 4 r. For simplicity this theta will come out in radians we take the value of r such that conversion to degrees becomes easy for us usually you take r to be 57 point 3 millimeter. If you take that you know that 1 radian is equal to 57.3 degrees 
So, to convert it into degrees, you have to multiply it by 57.3 and radius is there, it cancels out. So, you get straight away in such a camera, you get theta is equal to s by 4 in degrees. Right, but when there is a diffractor meter, we use do not use the X-ray film there. We use the Giger counters to measure how much how many packets of photons are coming. Right, a Giger counter is one of the such counters. Here the specimen is kept in the center again, and the Giger counter moves from this position and goes in that direction. These are the incident rays. When the movement is such, they see the when it is moving from here to there, it has moved a certain value of angle which is 2 theta. If there is a diffraction observed here, that angle is 2 theta. But the specimen rotates by an angle theta only, so that this angle is theta. So, the mm, machine is so synchronized, the specimen rotates by an angle theta, the Giger counter moves by an angle 2 theta. By the time Giger counter would have moved to 180 degrees, specimen would have just become perpendicular 90 degrees. Starting from this position, first specimen would have gone there and Giger counter would have moved from here to there. Again, I am able to measure the 2 theta values directly and that gives me the theta values. Let us go back to see how can we use this theta to find out the HKL and from HKL how do we find out the right in cubic crystal In cubic crystals, well of course, this is the Bragg law what we talked about. This is the D spacing related to the lattice parameter and the Miller indices of the plane HKL. If I substitute this D in here, I can say that and square it lambda square is equal to 4 a square 2 is becomes 4 a square and divided by h square plus k square plus l square and sin theta also becomes square sin square theta it is just rewritten and made the square. Now from here what I do is I take the denominator h square plus k square plus l square onto the left hand side and take the lambda square on the right hand side and then I separate out these a and lambda like this. So, h square plus k square plus l square is rewritten as equal to 4 a square by lambda square sin square theta. Now, for even if it is an unknown crystal what I have, lattice, lattice parameter is a constant, right. Lambda the characteristic radiation the x's I am using is also a constant, why I have separated this out is a constant. So, now I see that h square plus k square plus l square is proportional to sin square theta. That is a constant of proportionality 4 a square by lambda square. So, I have got the different values of theta and the sin square thetas which I obtained from there will be proportional to the h square plus k square plus l square. How is this h square plus k square plus l square helpful to me to get the HKL? If h square plus k square plus l square is 1, HKL could be 1 0 0 or 0 1 0 or 0 0 1 it is a question of family. If it is h square plus k square plus l square is 2, it is 1 1 0. If it is 3, it is 1 1 1. If it is 4, it is 2 0 0. If it is 5, 2 1 0. 6, it is 2 1 1. 8, 
there is no seven. You cannot find three integers if I square them and sum them, the sum will be seven. So therefore, I don't have h square plus k square plus l square is seven. I shall not have similarly fifteen. I shall not have twenty-three. Right, so on and so forth. There will be number of them which I will not have. So eight is two two zero, and nine is three zero zero. It can also be written as two two one. Two square plus two square plus one square. So that's how it is. Once I get the value of h square plus k square plus l square, I shall be able to know the plane which has diffracted this. Now there are rules which tell us. From what or for what values of h square plus k square plus l square, I shall be observing a diffraction beam from the crystal given crystal, or from which plane I will not be observing. That is, for a simple cubic crystal, all possible combinations of h square plus k square plus l square are observed. That means I observe one, I observe two, three, four, five, six, and seven is not there. I observe eight, nine, and ten. And so on, so forth. Right? All now in a simple cubic crystal, there is only one atom on the lattice. I don't have any two zero zero plane. Then what is the meaning of h square plus k square plus l square equal to four, which is two zero zero? Second order diffraction from one zero zero. That's very good. You have understood that. Now, similarly, in BCC, we get all even values of h square plus k square plus l square. That means I get two, four, six, eight is missing here. I think eight should also be there. But to simplify this, it becomes one. Two, three, four, five, six, but this becomes seven, which is not there. That's the distinction between this and this. If you get seven, you will not be able to get H K L. So you have to make it double. Call it fourteen, so that all others will also be doubled. That's the distinction between simple cube and body-centered cube. Right. Now, if I see the sim, uh, next one, which is face-centered cubic crystal, in here, but in here, what we observe is the HKL values are either all odd or all even. For this purpose, zero is taken as even. And we get the combinations like one one one, which makes it three, then two zero zero, which makes it four, then two two zero, which makes it eight, and you see that it is the combination three four eight, which is repeating after that. Eleven twelve sixteen. On eight, I add three, it becomes eleven. I add four, it becomes twelve. I add eight, eight, it becomes sixteen, like that. But in here, twenty eight is not possible. Again, twenty-eight is an integer where I cannot find the three integers and square them to get the sum equal to twenty-eight. Then, diamond cubic crystal is a crystal which we shall see in the next class, but it is on the same space lattice FCC. And here, when the space lattice is observed, because there are more than one atom sitting on the lattice point, some more intensities are extinguished. And those are, whenever h square plus k square plus l square is even, the odd multiples of four are missed out. That is, in three, four, eight, four is an odd multiple of four, eight is an even multiple of four, eight is observed but four is not observed. Similarly, twelve is an odd multiple of four, sixteen is an even multiple of four, sixteen is observed, twelve is not observed. So on and so forth. It goes on. That's the diamond cubic crystal, or crystals which crystallize like the cubic diamond. They will be showing this. 
and about the diamond cubic crystal we will talk about in the next class.